I have been invited to submit a paper for a special issue of the journal Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. The topic is electromagnetic field theories of consciousness. At first, I was quite surprised to be given this invitation. After all, my framework, the TICL, is not an electromagnetic field theory. Having read John Joe McFadden's recent article, Integrating Information in the Brain's EM Field, the Semi-Field Theory of Consciousness, I think I understand their interest. McFadden argues that the brain implements algorithms in a global EM field and that it does so in space, not in time. So I am in the position to argue in favor of integration in time rather than space. I am thus called upon to represent the opposition. When I developed and published my theory, I was not really aware of McFadden and the other EM guys. On one hand, I'm happy about that. Isolated from such ideas, I was able to elaborate my framework uncontaminated. Now I can see how it holds up against a counterproposal. I am supposed to send in the abstract, which is a short summary of my contribution by the end of April, so I'd better get to it. I'll use this episode to begin thinking about how my framework, which depends on integration in time, compares to an argument about integration in space by means of the brain's electromagnetic fields. We have established that consciousness is generated by activities in the thalamus, the cerebral cortex, and closely associated structures. I usually refer to this as the thalamocortical system, or thalamocortex. The neural substrate of consciousness does not include large areas of the central nervous system, like the cerebellum, the spinal cord, and the brainstem. A patient without a cerebellum, or with paraplegia, caused by a total lesion of the spinal cord, is nevertheless conscious when he is conscious, that is, when he is awake or dreaming. Stephen Hawking was clearly conscious in every sense of the word, even though information could not be transmitted between the periphery of his body and his brain proper. Furthermore, the thalamocortex does not exhibit consciousness during deep sleep or in states of general anesthesia, so it makes the most sense to begin by contrasting what occurs in non-conscious regions of the nervous system and during non-conscious states of the thalamocortex with those states in which consciousness is undeniable. To begin, let's tally up what's what is going on in the brain, whether we are conscious or not? First, neurons are firing action potentials. The brain is not shut down or suppressed in activity during non-conscious states. Ions, such as sodium, potassium, and chloride, cross the neuronal membrane through ion channels which open and close. This depolarizes neurons, and if it does so with significant magnitude, the neurons will fire their own action potentials. The neuron does this regardless of whether we are conscious or not. Synapses between neurons operate too, whether we are conscious or not. Neurotransmitter molecules are released, and receptors on the other cell are stimulated by them. Signaling between one neuron and another is not abrogated in non-conscious states. Moreover, regions of the brain, like the spinal cord and the cerebellum, function by means of networked neurons communicating with one another and influencing one another to fire action potentials. It is thus a mistake to assume that something about what a neuron and its partners can do enables consciousness. This can't be right. EEG has been used for many decades to crudely measure the brain's regional electromagnetic fields and infer the neuronal activities that underlie them. EEG looks quite different in states of consciousness compared to states of non-consciousness. So the cortical neurons are acting differently, but they are not ceasing to act even under general anesthesia and electromagnetic fields are produced continually by those activities. Marcello Massimini and Giulio Tononi describe the differences between consciousness and non-consciousness in their book Sizing Up Consciousness, in which they write, quote, The neurons of the sleeping brain are constantly on the move. So the question is, why does consciousness fade during non-REM sleep, even when neural activity does not? Why is it that when we wake someone from deep non-REM sleep, especially early in the night, and ask them to report anything that was going through your mind just before waking up, they will often say that they were not there. They were coming out of nowhere, out of nothingness, as if I didn't exist. As we said before, this fading of consciousness, consciousness that dwindles into oblivion, is not accompanied by a commensurate decline in neural activity. There is a difference in how the neurons fire, certainly. The most significant difference seems to be that during non-REM sleep, the sequence of impulses emitted by the neurons become intermittent." Unquote. What happens is this. 
During non-conscious states, the more a thalamocortical neuron fires action potentials, the more likely it is to fall into a down state, a period of non-activity. The result is that during deep sleep or under anesthesia, a pattern of large synchronous waves of activity occur. By contrast, when we are awake or dreaming, the EEG is rapidly changing in asynchronous, as if the individual neurons are firing freely. This suggests that the brain's electromagnetic fields are more synchronous when we are not conscious. I'm going to quote directly from episode 6 of the podcast here to set the stage for today. I said, quote, Let's start with the insight provided by IIT and undeniable given the evidence and a rational perspective. The physical substrate of consciousness must constitute a single integrated entity. Conscious experiences are united. How? Because we have single large integrated entity made up of a large portion of the thalamus and cortex under enabling conditions. In my framework, I refer to this simply as the system and I define it as a single massive entity with some non-zero degree of temporally integrated causality across all of its neuronal elements. So what is temporally integrated causality? I described in a previous episode how a neuron exhibits causality on another neuron to which it communicates by means of action potentials. The firing activity of a neuron therefore has some amount of causality on its targets. The more firing activity, the more synapses it makes with its target and the stronger those synapses are, the more power the neuron has to influence its target neuron in the network. But this power must take place over a very short time frame if it is to be of any effect. This is because the target neuron's membrane potential will shortly return to its former level, its resting membrane potential. Temporally integrated causality, TIC, is a term I have given to the amount of causality one thalamocortical element has on another, divided by the delay in that causality. So a given amount of causality requiring a long period of time will, will yield a lower level of TIC than the same amount of causality occurring in a short time frame. The large integrated network that makes up the system is composed of a huge number of neuronal elements and all of them have some degree of temporally integrated causality on all of the others and indeed on themselves. In general, the more distance and the more synaptic contacts that it takes to influence another neuron in the network, the lower the TIC between one element and another will be. For my framework, all neuronal elements which are integrated at a non-zero level are part of the system. Neurons can influence the system from outside of it, and other neurons can be influenced by elements of the system. But if they are not integrated, sharing cause-effect power in both directions, then they are not in the system." Unquote. According to my framework, the system is composed of a massive number of neuronal elements. Many of these neurons will be influencing one another to a high degree, way higher than the level of integration across the whole system. The whole system is integrated, but over a longer duration of time, so it has a lower TIC. The elements that have a higher TIC will form, for some period of time, a subsystem. This makes each subsystem an integrated entity within a larger integrated entity. A naive proposal equating consciousness directly to integrated information would conclude that small networks, which I call subsystems, would each be separately conscious. So rather than a single unified conscious mind, the brain would produce thousands of them at any given time. But we are seeking to explain the unified conscious mind that is known to you and me. Sorry, Mario, but our princess is in another castle. It can't be that conscious being is simply integration of causality. There has to be something more to it. For IIT, the answer is given by a specific time frame, a temporal constant for consciousness. Only that integrated activity in the brain that is maximal across that precise time frame is conscious. This doesn't work for me. I don't think physics gives a damn about any special time frame. There is nothing special about 200 milliseconds or 230 milliseconds or whatever the constant is determined to be. The TICL has a different solution. It says that the whole integrated thalamocortical system experiences the more integrated networks within it. The more integrated subsystems produce content that is meaningful to the larger system. This allows for changes to occur within the perceived moment. Having this general idea of my perspective on consciousness, let's take a look at what McFadden is saying. McFadden's paper begins by introducing the idea of binding, which is how at the same time we experience many things, many contents, but they're united. I have called consciousness a composition of contents, which is just another way of saying a bounded composition of individual contents. McFadden points out that these contents must be bound in the form of physical integration. I agree. Next he talks about physical integration and says the following, quote, 
Ryle insisted that it is a category error to suppose that structures such as the University of Oxford have material existence. To make his point, he imagined a visitor to Oxford who visits the library and colleges, but then asked, but where is the university? The visitor's error is to assume that the university is a member of the category of material objects, rather than an institution which exists causally only in the minds of the students, staff, and visitors to the university. Ryle calls this kind of mistake a category error. An analogous argument can be made for integrated information. University institutions, such as registry finance, the libraries, exam boards, colleges, or executives, integrate and process vast amounts of varied information ranging from student entry criteria, applicant qualifications, book catalogs, exam performance, timetables, or salaries. However, this integration, like the institution itself, is causal rather than physical. In the sense that downstream effects, such as the posting of offers of university places, depends on a multiplicity of upstream informational causes, such as the arrival of application forms and their scrutiny by academics and administrators, the integration is via a causal chain of operations in time, rather than physical integration in space." Unquote. McFadden goes on to talk about computation, as for example done by a Turing machine or some other circuit-based system. This is not integration. So I guess I agree with the author on this point, but I wonder if he is suggesting that this is what theorists such as Giulio Tononi and I are claiming. We certainly are not. In fact, this kind of feed-forward computation is just like the neuronal processing that occurs in non-conscious brain structures, like the spinal cord and the cerebellum. These non-conscious structures are agreed to be non-conscious precisely because they are not integrated. So they cannot provide an example of temporal integration, at least not as consciousness theorists mean it. I have made the claim that a neuronal network is integrated to the extent that each of its elements is both a cause and an effect in the network. A neuron's behavior in such an integrated network not only influences the future state of its target neurons, but all the other integrated neurons, including itself. Next, McFadden proposes that electromagnetic fields are truly physically integrated, but not in time. He writes this, quote, EM waves travel at the speed of light across huge distances. However, their strength is subject to an inverse square, electric component, or cube, magnetic component, law, so that the EM field perturbation of a single neuron rapidly falls off with distance. In my earlier paper, I estimated that the EM field electrical perturbation from the firing of a single neuron extends into a volume of only about 80 millimeters, encompassing a maximum of about 200 neurons. So in contrast to matter-based signals that do not attenuate with distance, signals passing through the semi-field will tend to act only locally, unless boosted by chains of synchronization. Note, however, and very importantly, that in contrast to temporally integrated information, an algorithm in space can function only when its computational nodes fire synchronously, so that their inputs are simultaneously available to all the components of the network. Therefore, a key prediction of the proposal that consciousness is distributed EM field-based algorithms is that conscious information will be correlated with synchronously firing neurons." Unquote. The part about the attenuation of the EM at distance is good, because we know from split-brain patients that there really is a division of conscious access which occurs when an incision divides the hemispheres. McFadden even addresses this in his paper, so this is not a problem for his theory. But the necessary link between synchronous neural activity and consciousness provides, I think, a major obstacle to the semi-field theory. Recall that the greatest synchronicity of neuronal firing activities occurs in non-conscious states, especially under general anesthesia. By contrast, neurons fire at high frequency and very asynchronously in the cortex during wakefulness and dreaming. But let's think this through. Most neural activities across the thalamic cortex at any given time are not producing conscious content. Their activities are background with respect to consciousness. Otherwise, we would be conscious, consciously perceiving everything our receptors pick up all the time. Since consciousness is actually quite limited in this respect, I have accounted in my theoretical framework for this phenomenon by requiring that the temporally integrated causality for a subsystem be higher than that of the whole system. If the TIC of a network is not higher than the system, then there is no subsystem and thus no content. It's just background activity against which real activity gains meaning. McFadden writes, quote, Several decades ago, work conducted by Wolf Singer and colleagues demonstrated that neurons in the monkey brain fire synchronously when the animal attends to the stimulus. 
Many additional studies confirmed and extended these findings to many different experimental systems. For example, work in David Leopold's laboratory at Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen, Germany, investigated awake monkeys trained to respond to a visual stimulus. The removal of a red dot from a target area by pulling a lever to receive their fruit juice reward. The researchers monitored both neuron spiking and changes in local EM field potentials in V1, V2, and V4 regions of the monkey's visual cortex. They demonstrated that spiking of neurons in cortical areas V1 and V2 was totally uncorrelated with the monkey's perception of the target. However, low frequency modulation of local field potentials presumed to be generated by synchronously firing neurons in these same regions did correlate with perception. It seems that though neuron firing uh, rate in the primary visual cortex does not see the stimulus, synchronicity of neuron firing does indeed see the target. Many subsequent studies have also demonstrated that neural synchrony also correlates with conscious perception in humans. For example, neural synchrony patterns were found to correlate with the conscious recognition by subjects exposed to optical illusions. More recent work has demonstrated that conscious auditory perception is correlated with long-range synchrony of gamma oscillations. Synchronization between the anterior and posterior cortex has been shown to correlate with conscious, consciousness levels of patients who have suffered traumatic brain injury. Of course, there may be several different and often contradictory signals being simultaneously projected into the semi-field by networks or clusters of synchronizing neurons. Even so, what is distinctive about the semi-field in contrast to many other theories of consciousness is that, because EM fields are always unified, there is only ever one EM field in the brain." Unquote. Okay, so there might be synchrony on a background of asynchrony. That synchrony would be expected to occur among those neurons which make up what I call a subsystem. But, and this is important, how synchronous do they have to be to integrate in space but not time? A subsystem is integrated at a high level relative to the system. This implies that its member activities are more synchronous to one another than, than to the rest of the brain's neurons, but they aren't precisely synchronous. They aren't firing in perfect unison. Some neurons fire, and others get the signal which they project to other neurons, and the signal feeds back to the original neurons in a tight temporal frame. But that is not perfect synchrony. McFadden implies that perfect synchrony is a requirement of a semi-field theory because he says that the integration occurs in space rather than time. It seems obvious to me that some amount of time, however brief, is completely necessary for consciousness if neuronal communication has anything to do with it. Thus constrained, the semi-field theory could only apply to neuronal dynamics occurring at exactly, and I mean exactly, the same time. But features of the world which impinge upon our various receptor systems could never arrive in the thalamic cortex at the same time. And yet these features are subject to binding as far as we are experiencing them. I claim that a temporal window is absolutely necessary to explain our unified conscious experiences. This will allow the feature binding of object colors, textures, and contours which would be subject to appearing and disappearing independently with only spatial integration by means of the semi-field. Further, we see these things changing against a background which does not change. We see movement. We hear sounds getting closer or rapidly occurring in succession. This could be an illusion, but I'm inclined to doubt that. In any case, perfect synchrony seems unlikely. Remember, we're talking about physics. McFadden seems to literally mean integration over a space without the passage of time. Any time. McFadden writes, quote, The idea that the seat of consciousness is simply the brain's EM field may initially sound outlandish, but it's no more extraordinary than the claim that the seat of consciousness is the matter of the brain. All it involves is going from the right to the left-hand side of Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, therefore replacing the notion that consciousness is encoded by matter of the brain with that of proposing that it is encoded by the energy of the EM fields generated by the motions of its charged matter. Note that by illustrating this idea with Einstein's equation, I am not, of course, proposing any interconversion of matter and energy in the brain. Matter and en energy are equally physical. But instead of being composed of material, the semi-field theory proposes that our thoughts are composed of the brain's EM field energy. This is a kind of dualism, but it is scientific dualism based on the physical difference between matter and energy, rather than a metaphysical distinction between matter and spirit. Although, as I have argued, shifting from matter to energy of the brain is conceptually trivial, when searching for an appropriate substrate in the brain that can physically integrate complex information, the move draws an immediate payoff, as it effortlessly solves the binding problem. 
Whereas information encoded in the matter of neurons is, as I have argued, always localized and discrete, both in space and time, information in the field is always integrated yet distributed, in the sense that it may be downloaded from any point within the field. Unquote. Hang on. Who said that consciousness is composed of matter? I have said that consciousness is composed of integrated causality. That means energy, not matter. I think Tononi and other IIT researchers would agree with that. Of course, this explanation is equally physical. And the TICL does not suffer from the binding problem either. It seems to me that synchrony in the measured EM field will correlate with conscious contents because subsystems are tightly integrated in time. For the TICL, a subsystem is a group of neurons which might be close to one another or quite distributed across the cortex, but which are influencing one another to a high degree in both directions, cause and effect. This necessarily takes time, but not a long time. We're talking about milliseconds. Recall that the temporally integrated causality of a subsystem is the amount of causality among the neurons in the subsystem divided by the amount of time it takes to achieve that causality. So the shorter the time frame necessary to integrate the causality, the higher the TIC and the more salient the content. I call this a landscape because we experience a whole composition of contents, but the composition is limited. The subsystems produce peaks of TIC against a background of neuronal activities across the whole thalamic cortex. Thus you have a huge ground studded with peaks of activity, and you experience the peaks. For the TICL, it really doesn't matter whether the causality comes in the form of field computation or neuronal firing from one neuron to another. The EM field may or may not be functioning in the brain. As ions pass across the cell membrane, as action potentials spike along the axons, there will be a measurable EM field whether it does anything or not. We can measure it by EEG. If we had an electrical device or an electric cable, we could measure the nearby EM field there too. This is true even though the EM field is not doing the work. It is only a side effect of the work being done. If you'll allow me, I'd like to share with you one more passage from McFadden's paper before this analysis is through. He writes, quote, What is distinctive about the semi-field in contrast to many other theories of consciousness is that because EM fields are always unified, there is only ever one EM field in the brain. The dominant information in consciousness will then be the one that is associated with the strongest EM field perturbation capable of modulating neural firing within that singular field. This has been demonstrated in numerous studies. For example, the 2005 study that demonstrated that increased gamma band synchrony predicts switching of conscious perceptual objects in classic binocular rivalry. Similar switches in EEG or MEG patterns have been shown to predict conscious percepts in numerous studies, opening the possibility of mind reading by decoding brain EM field signals. In nearly all of these studies, the conscious percept corresponds to the dominant EM field signal, suggesting that competition between rival percepts is resolved through positive feedback loops within re-entrant circuits, leading to what Dehane calls a global ignition, or avalanche, of the dominant signal. Therefore, in contrast to other theories of consciousness, such as global workspace or integrated information theory, IIT, that use arbitrary or ill-defined thresholds for access to consciousness, the semi-field relies on a measurable physical parameter, the strength of EM field perturbations that are capable of modulating neural firing, to differentiate between conscious and non-conscious brain information. From a neuronal perspective, there appears to be no obvious reason why synchrony should make a difference to neural processing. Neurons deliver the same information and perform the same informational processing whether or not they are firing synchronously. Of course, many theorists of consciousness do incorporate neural synchrony by, for example, viewing it as a signature of the re-entrant neural connectivity, characteristic of globally distributed neuronal circuits that are proposed to underpin consciousness, or a consequence of coincidence detection within neurons involved in conscious thoughts. Yet neurons need not fire synchronously to distribute information globally, and re-entrant circuits need not necessarily fire synchronously. Similarly, there seems to be no obvious reason why conscious neural processing requires coincidence detection any more than non-conscious neural processing, as they both perform temporal information integration. So synchrony per se is neither a necessary nor sufficient requirement for consciousness in matter-based neuronal models of consciousness. As far as I am aware, it is only in the EM field theories that synchrony plays an obligatory role in conscious information processing." Unquote. The TICL does not require synchrony of neuronal activity, but near synchrony 
in the field potential is expected for the most salient contents of consciousness. Because once again, the TIC of the subsystem producing the content is the total integrated causality across the subsystem's elements over the duration of time required. This implies that the shorter the time frame required, the higher the TIC. So all of the other things being equal, the closer to synchronous the subsystem's causality is, the higher the TIC. This accounts for the same evidence that McFadden cites in favor of his semi-field theory. The difference could be established experimentally by measuring the synchrony with high temporal precision. I think we will see that what neuroscientists generally mean by synchrony is not perfect synchrony as the semi-field requires, but rather synchrony over a window, not in space after all, but one which opens in time. The window in time is the present moment as we experience it. When there is nothing in the window, we are conscious of no content. But when all of the system's activities are synchronized together, the window itself is closed. There is no distinction to be made between background and signal, and consequently, there is no consciousness.